live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the handful of you that clapped for me. Now, y'all don't have to do that. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. My name is Chris. I'm the host of the Science Cafe. I'm glad you're here tonight. We got a full house. People really like some astrophysics, don't you? The last astrophysics talk we had packed out the house, too. But maybe it's just because you like cartooning, illustrations, drawing. Yeah, tonight we've got a really fun program bringing art and science all together to tell some pretty interesting stories. And there's a lot going on here at the museum, right? Like tonight, we've got an awesome science cafe planned for you, two incredible speakers. But this is sort of the prelude to even more exciting things that are going to be happening again tomorrow night and then Saturday and Sunday. If you know what's this weekend, yell it at me. Fantastic. I love a smart audience. Astronomy days. Yeah, January 27 and 28. Two full days here at the Museum of Science, Astronomy, Astrophysics, Space presentations, special lectures. We have astronaut Doug Wheelock who's going to be coming to the museum and giving three presentations. Two on Saturday, one on Sunday. Get here early if you want to get in for those. Seating is limited. And then we have to shut the doors and we don't let you in. So three engagements to see the astronaut. I'm telling you now, don't get mad at me on Saturday and Sunday. And then lots of other cool special presentations. Museum astrophysicists Rachel Smith and Patrick Troidhart are going to be doing presentations. We're going to be Skyping in astronomers and scientists from the American Museum of Natural History to do presentations in the Daily Planet Theater. You want to be here for at least some of Astronomy Days. That's Saturday and Sunday. Tomorrow night, we're going to be doing a little bit of science fiction. We're going to be showing Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan for our finally Friday where science meets Khan. There it is. Jorge in the back. Yeah, so uh, you can get tickets on that for that online at the museum's website or at the box office tomorrow. I don't think we've sold out yet, but it's a Star Trek thing, so I expect that we will. So go ahead and get ready for that. Costumes are encouraged. I want to see your Star Trek gear. That's lots of fun. And the other announcement that I have to make is that for many of you, you've seen me. I've been hosting science cafes for about a year and a half now, and this is the first time I am wearing a tie. In fact, this is probably the first time in 18 months I've worn a tie, because Astronomy Days is the only time a year that I am willing to put on a tie, and it's because I have a space tie. My space tie, though, it's fun. It's the Apollo Soyuz mission. So when the American spacecraft docked with a Russian spacecraft in this symbol of peace during the height of the Cold War, it was a great symbol of two things coming together to try to do something even greater, right? And tonight's Science Cafe, although these two guests are not at war with one another, or Cold War with one another, um, have done the same thing. Now they're both scientists. Uh, Jorge Cham, he's got a PhD in robotics. and somehow, maybe we'll learn tonight, took all of that experience and pushed it into a career illustrating, but telling stories, right? And then we have Daniel Whiteson from the University of California at Irvine, who's an astrophysicist, who apparently, based on the title of their book, doesn't know much of anything. No, that's not true, is it? If you haven't seen it already, We Have No Idea is the title of their book tonight, and I would encourage everyone to pick up a copy, or at least buy all the ones that they brought with them tonight. It makes them look good, and it makes me look good. However much it costs, it's probably worth it. I also have one other thing to tell you about. In the spirit of bringing two incredible things together, on February 23rd, on all the tables you should have one of these little bookmarks. February 23rd, we're bringing John Grisham, famous author, and John Hart to May Mandy Concert Hall at the Duke Energy Center. So once again, bringing science and art 
together to serve humanity. Get tickets for this event. We're going to have a fantastic evening of conversation. And this event is in support of the Museum of Natural Sciences. So these two great authors are coming together in order to support programming and research that's happening right here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So I know you all want to support us. A great way to do it would be to come and see us at that event. Now that all of the advertising is done, I sold all the things that I could sell. Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage Jorge Cham and Daniel Whiteson. Hello! <laughs> all right, how's it going? Let me try that again. How's it going? All right. Not much better, but uh, we'll take it. Now, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, so I'm Jorge Cham, as Chris mentioned, and this is Daniel Whiteson. And together, we're the authors of this book called We Have No Idea. Uh, now, I'm a cartoonist. I illustrated all the cartoons in the book, all the illustrations in the book. And uh, I am a cartoonist. And as Chris said, I also happen to have a PhD in robotics. And um, you might be wondering, what does having a PhD in robotics have to do with being a cartoonist? Well, I can tell you that my parents were also very worried about that <laughs> whole life plan thing. Uh, but I am a cartoonist. I draw something called PhD comics. I, these are comics that I put up on the internet. And I've been doing that for several years. And uh, a couple of years ago um, that I was doing this, a couple of years ago, I got this email out of the blue from this professor at the University of California at Irvine called Daniel Whiteson. And he said to me, uh, he wrote to me in this email, he said, Jorge, I've seen your comics on the internet, uh, and I like them. And so I'd l I would like to pay you, I would like to commission you to draw some comics about the Higgs boson. And so I thought, what? You want to pay me? What? <laughs> what is that? I just put things on the internet for free. Uh, but Daniel, uh, was, this was around the time that they discovered the Higgs boson, and he just didn't feel like people out there, all the, the newspapers and the new magazines, they were, he didn't feel they were doing a great job describing what the Higgs boson was or why they were looking for it. And so he sort of decided to take matters into his own hands and contact our cartoonists and create something that explained what this was. And so we worked together. We made this a video and comics that explained what the Higgs boson was. That uh, sort of went viral when the Higgs boson uh, was discovered, and people were pointing to it as the clearest and easiest to understand explanation of what this phenomenon was. And so I thought that was really cool that the clearest and easiest explanation actually came from one of the scientists that worked on that project. And so uh, I always encourage scientists, if there are any here today, to also take that initiative and come out to uh, events like these and then create stuff that explains things to the public. Uh, but we, I really enjoyed working with them, and so we worked together on a couple of other projects. The latest one is this book, We Have No Idea. And so here is Daniel to talk to us about the ideas in We Have No Idea. Thank you, Jorge. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and it's also a pleasure to work on this project with Jorge. Uh, he told you that funny story about how we got started. There's a little wrinkle in there that maybe he's too modest to share with you. If you guys don't know, Jorge is not just some online cartoonist. He's a rock star in academia. I go around physics labs all around the world, and there's always one of his cartoons on the wall, especially the ones that capture like graduate student suffering, or the, <laughs> the awkward relationship between students and their professors, right? And so th he's everywhere. So when I had this idea, maybe we can explain physics using cartoons, I don't have any artistic skill myself, so I thought, who can I get to draw these things? So my wife, who's also a, an academic and a big fan of Jorge's, she said, why don't you email Jorge Chom and ask him? And I thought, sure, and then after that, I'll email Brad Pitt and see if he wants to do a movie project together, right? Uh, so I still haven't heard back from Brad, but, um, but here I am doing this awesome project with Jorge, so it's been a real pleasure. Right, so we're here to tell you about our book, and there are a lot of popular science books out there being written, and a lot of them are great. Most of them are telling you what science has learned, what science knows about the universe, which is a lot, and it's really awesome. But our book is something different. Our book is about all the things that science hasn't figured out, the big open questions of the universe. So you might be thinking, well, if I go to hear a book, uh, go to hear about a book by a scientist, I want that scientist to be an expert in the field, right? You read a book about biology, you want to hear from a biologist. 
So you might be asking, you know, what's this guy an expert in, right? Um, ignorance, right? So it's not like I'm not a professor of ignorance or anything. But I do have a real passion for what science doesn't know. Because for me, science isn't as much about the things we know as a way to learn things. And the only way you're going to make crazy discoveries and unravel something deep about the universe is if you embrace what we don't know. And so that's the point of our book. And it really began from when I was a kid and I was learning about the Age of Explorers. These guys, all they had to do to discover something new was jump in a ship, sail across an ocean, and they could like walk across a beach that nobody had ever walked across before. Or they could eat a fruit that nobody had ever tasted. And I wanted that experience. I wanted to be the first person to know something, the first person to do something, to be on the forefront of human knowledge, right? I mean, imagine all the first in human history. Somebody got to be the first person to ever see the Grand Canyon, right? Wow, what an experience. Or the first person to eat chocolate, right? That's fortunate. Or the first person to eat chocolate while looking at the Grand Canyon, right? These all count. I wanted one of those experiences. But the more you look at the world, it, the more you feel like, well, maybe the age of explorers is over, right? I mean, thanks to Google Earth and satellites, we know where all the land is. You can't get in your ship and find a new island to name after your dog anymore, right? Um, and the more you look around, the more you're amazed at what science has achieved, right? We have these incredible airplanes. You can fly across an ocean in this metal tube. You can download all of human knowledge into a device that fits on your pocket, right? It's truly incredible. You might be forgiven for thinking, wow, science basically has it all figured out, right? You know? And this is as close as I get to Brad Pitt right here, right? And thanks to modern technology, he has no excuse not to answer my emails. But so you might think, well, maybe science is it all figured out, right? Well, the point of our book is that the, exactly the opposite is true. We are trying to make the case that we're beginning a new era of exploration, a new age of discovery, where we're going to learn things about the universe which seem shocking to us today. Okay? In the future, we hope, people will know things about the universe which make us seem primitive in our ignorance. So that's the point of the book, and that's what we want to emphasize today. So in the book, we talk about lots of things that we don't know about the universe. Oh. I'm going to cut you off after three zeros there. In the book, we talk about lots of the things that we don't know about in the universe. But my professional career is focused on this one. What is the universe made of? And to me, this is a pretty basic question. You know, As a conscious being, I wonder, like, what am I made out of? What are you made out of? What is this whole organizing principle behind this ridiculous, beautiful universe we find ourselves in? It's, and I'm not the first person to ask this question, certainly not. I think it's probably an ancient question. I think people have been asking this question since people have been asking questions, you know? All you need to ask this question is two rocks. You bang them together, you make smaller rocks. You bang those together, you get smaller rocks. And you can ask, how long can I do this for? At some point, is it no longer a rock, right? At some point, is it something else? Or is there a minimum size of a rock that you could ever possibly have? I literally asked myself these questions as a kid, right? So it's not a surprise that I became a particle physicist. But I like to think of this as the particle physicist origin story, right? If we were superheroes, we would have this kind of origin story. Also, if we were superheroes, we would probably wear capes, right? That would be cool. I've never seen a professor wearing a cape. All right, but imagine for a moment that you were the first person to think of this question, OK? You are a caveman or cavewoman physicist, and you think, what is this world around me made out of, right? You get to take the first bite of this intellectual apple. How do you do that? How do you answer such a big question? Well, in science, when we face a really, really big question, basically what we do is we do the stupidest thing first, OK? Let's just do that and see if it works. If it doesn't, then we'll do try the second stupidest idea. So maybe the stupidest or the simplest way to approach this question is to answer it with a list and say, well, what's in the universe, right? Let's start there. So you might say, well, I'm in the universe. You're in the universe, right? There's a bunch of rocks in the universe, right? This is caveman times, right? And there's a lot of problems with this approach, right? One problem with this, this approach is there's a lot of rocks in the universe. So your list is going to be super duper duper long. And then you have philosophical problems like, does the list belong on the list? You know, this kind of stuff. Um, the real problem, though, is that the universe has much more than just rocks in it, right? As you look around, if you want to answer this question, what's the universe made out of? You have to explain rocks. You also have to explain ice cream and water and blueberries. And that's the difficulty in this question is that the world is filled with amazing, complex stuff that you have to explain all of it, right? You can't just explain the rocks or the blueberries. You have to explain how this incredible complexity came about. 
And the more you look, the more you're amazed at the crazy stuff that's in this universe, right? We have bicycles, we have, um, you know, spoons, we have stars, we have crazy muscular guys to become governor of California, right? I mean, it's a weird, weird universe we live in, right? Um, one day I will be that buff, Jorge, okay? One day. Not with all this travel, but one day. And then you might ask, well, is this really the right approach? Like, is a list the answer? I mean, imagine you could ask the oracle or God or nature or whatever you believe in for an answer to one question. You said, what is the universe made out of? And you got a list of everything in the universe. Would you feel like you really got an answer? Would you have an aha moment? Like, ah, that really teaches me something? No, that'd be totally unsatisfying, right? It's a technical answer. It's like you ask a teenager, where are you going? And they say, out. Right? It's like, okay, you answered the question, but you didn't really answer the question, right? So what kind of answer are we looking for? Well, in particle physics, we're reductionists, which means we try to explain all the complex stuff we see in terms of a few simple building blocks, right? We're looking to peel back a layer of reality and explain all this complexity in terms of a smaller set of objects. That's the goal. That's how we try to explain everything. So how do we get there? Well, we don't just make a list, we organize our knowledge. And we say, well, all this stuff over, here, stuff over here is living, and all that stuff over there is sort of like a rock, and this stuff over here looks like this. And you know, you can argue, does Arnold belong in the category of living things or rocks? I don't know. You can have your own opinion, but everything belongs somewhere. And then you start to notice patterns. So you organize everything you know, you notice patterns, and those patterns lead to questions. You're like, why is this like this? Why is this organized in this way? Those questions are critical because those questions are the clues that are gonna lead you to figure out what is the organizing principle underlying everything. And that's why our book is all about questions. All right, so let's fast forward a few hundred years or a few thousand years, depending if you give the Greeks any credit. I don't give the Greeks any credit myself. Um, and you can say, well, everything that we see around us, everything that you've ever interacted with, everything you've ever tasted or touched or sat on, all of those things can be built out of just a few basic building blocks, right? We're talking about the periodic table. A hundred basic building blocks in the periodic table describes everything you know, right? And that's astounding. It's really astounding because if your goal was to start from infinite complexity and explain everything in terms of one or two things, Going from infinity down to 100, that's most of the way, right? So you might be thinking, well, this guy's a particle physicist. Why are we hearing about basic high school chemistry? It's basic high school chemistry. It's also one of the most underrated intellectual achievements in human history, in my view. Because going from 100 down to 1, that's the details compared to infinity to 100, right? So it's pretty impressive. But we don't just list our knowledge of the periodic table, right? We look at the periodic table, we notice, well, it's periodic, right? There are patterns here. What do those patterns mean, right? These guys are metallic, and these guys are active, and those guys are inactive, and there's this weird structure. We now know, of course, that all the structures in the periodic table, those patterns that lead us to ask questions, they're just clues. They're clues that tell us what's going on underneath, right? Jorge, this is not a game of Tetris. I know you get bored sometimes, look at that. <laughs> Ooh, he's going to score. All right. So let's zoom in, right? Everything in the periodic table, of course, you know, comes from the structure of the atom, how the electron orbitals fill each other up, etc. All that tells you what's going on in the periodic table. And I don't tell you this because I think you don't know it, but to remind you that the structures in the periodic table, the patterns that lead to questions, those are the things that tell us what's going on underneath. And that's important to remember because in a moment when we get to the forefront of human knowledge, we're gonna use that same strategy to hope to find clues to reveal what's be beneath what we do know. All right, so inside the atom, of course, we have protons and neutrons, right? But the atom itself is not the most fundamental unit of the universe, right? Nothing that you know or see or familiar with, nothing you've interacted with or experienced in your macroscopic universe is a basic building block of the universe. The universe is made out of something weird and strange, something that's really difficult to understand. Not atoms, not llamas, not tornadoes, certainly not llama tornadoes, right? Laminados. There we go. There's Brad Pitt running away from the tornado. He should have called me. All right. So let's zoom in on the periodic table, right? We have uh, the atom, and inside the atom we have protons and neutrons. And inside the protons and neutrons you have these funny little guys called quarks. Up quarks and down quarks you need to make protons and neutrons. That means something amazing. That means that with just up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, you can make any atom, which means you can make 
anything that you have ever interacted with. All that stuff, that thing you tripped on in second grade, right? That weird thing you ate last week, all that stuff is made out of just three things. If I was a, gonna write a cookbook, it would only have three ingredients in it, right? Up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, and every recipe would just be mix, right? It's amazing to me that you can describe the whole universe, I mean, everything you've interacted with, with just these three particles. But that's not the end of the story. You might think, maybe they're almost there, right? Maybe they've almost figured everything out. They're down to just three particles, right? Well, there are other wrinkles to this story, unfortunately. You know about the up quark, the down quark, and the electron, but there are four other quarks, right? The charm, the strange, the top, and the bottom quarks. And the electron is just an example of particles we call leptons. There's five others of them, so there's six leptons total. But again, when we want to understand the universe, we don't just list our knowledge, right? We don't just say, oh, here's what we know. We organize it, and then we look for patterns. So now we have a new table. This time it's a table of the fundamental particles, right? So we have the up quark, you can see it there on the top left, the down quark, the electron. and the bottom, we also have the weird little neutrino particle. But the amazing thing is that the other eight particles that we know about, they fall into this cool pattern. So the up quark, is just like the charm quark and the top quark. They're exactly identical, they have all the same behaviors, except the charm quark is like a heavy version of the up quark. And the top quark is like a heavy version of the up quark. It's like the up quark has these two fat secret cousins that nobody knew about, right? Why are they there? We don't know. And the incredible thing is that every particle in the first column also has two fat cousins, right? There's definitely something going on here, right? The universe is sending us a message. Everything comes in this really cool structure, right? This periodic table is even neater than the periodic table of the elements. It's like the universe is telling us something. It's a clue that says, something is going on here, you better figure it out, right? So if we look at this table, we have lots of questions we can ask. First of all, we can ask, why do we have all these particles, right? We need three particles to make up most of matter. Why do we have 12? For that matter, do we, do we have 12, or are there 12,000, or are there 12 billion, right? There's nothing in theoretical physics that says there can't be 12 billion kinds of particles out there. Is this the whole ice cube, or just the tip of the iceberg, right? We don't know. Um, I think it's fascinating that every particle has two copies, right? Every time you see a number in physics, you have to wonder what that number means. And so here we have the number three, right? There's three columns of particles here. And so uh, I look at this number and I think, why three? I mean, imagine that you got a, the physics to go to boil down to a single equation that you could fit onto a t-shirt. Maybe I could switch and try this mic. Thank you. All right, let's try this microphone. All right, so what if you could boil down all of physics into a single equation that you could fit onto a t-shirt, right? And say that equation had a number in it, like the number seven, just to make up a number. If there's a seven in the fundamental equation of the universe, that means that somehow the universe is seven-ish, right? There's something deeply seven-y about the universe. So every time you see a number in an equation, you have to ask why. So I see this three columns of particles, and I say, why three? Is three a deep number in the universe? I mean, if you're Catholic, then you probably definitely believe three is a deep number in the universe, right? But for physicists, it's not clear why the number there is three. Um, so we wonder why some of these particles are really heavy and some of them are really light. We don't know the answer. Some of these particles have really weird electric charges and they just happen to add up just right so they make the electron and the proton which perfectly balance each other out. Why is that? Is it a cosmic coincidence or is it a clue? I think all of these questions are clues that are screaming to us Something else is going on here. There's a simpler explanation. Maybe all these particles are made out of the same little pieces. Maybe they're all just different sides of the same coin. In 100 years or in 500 years, I think people will look back and say, oh, it was so obvious, right? If I had been a theoretical physicist back then, I could have written a paper and figured it all out. It's so clear. But now we're here at the forefront of human ignorance, right? Not knowing which direction to go in. It's much harder when you don't know which way to go. But we know that these clues are telling us something. Now, we don't just judge the theory of particle physics by how well it describes matter. We also ju judge it by how short it is. Can it fit onto a t-shirt? So here we put for you the equation 
the current standard model of particle physics, and you know, it's maybe a little bit of ways from fitting onto a t-shirt, unless that t-shirt's gonna be really big, or maybe the font just has to be super duper small, right? So that's the current status in particle physics. But the biggest problem with answering this question, what is the universe made out of, is not about all the particles. It's the fact that everything you've seen, everything you've studied, everything we know, all the stars and planets and gas and dust and pies and Eskimos, all that stuff, only adds up to 5% of what's actually in the universe. The rest of it is something totally different, something we're only beginning to understand that we don't understand. So if we want to answer the question, what's the universe made out of, you can't just focus on this little 5%, right? We don't know if that 5% is typical or totally weird and different from the rest of the universe, right? So how can we possibly know what fraction of the universe we understand, right? Well, part of the story came when people were looking at galaxies and how they spin. So you can think of galaxies as sort of a massive cosmic um, merry-go-round with a bunch of ping pong balls on it. What happens when you spin the ping pong, spin the merry-go-round? Well, the ping pong balls are gonna fly out into outer space, right? Unless there's some force holding them together and keeping them inside the galaxy. So in the case of stars, that force is gravity. It holds them in the galaxy and keeps them from flying out into intergalactic space. So you can do something cool. You can say, well, I can measure how fast the galaxy is going, so I know how much gravity I need to hold the stars in place, then I can measure the gravity by adding up the stars and saying, okay, there's this much stuff, which means this much gravity. Does it work out? Do I have enough gravity to hold the galaxies together? Now, this is a thing we do in science all the time. You say, well, we have two ways to do something. Let's do it both ways and check. 99.999% of the time, it works out and it's totally boring and we get exactly the answer we expect. Sometimes it's super awesome because it doesn't agree, and that's a clue that we don't understand something. So that's what happened here. It turns out the galaxies are rotating way too fast. There's not nearly enough gravity to hold the stars in to those galaxies. But the galaxies are not throwing stars into interstellar space, right? So there must be something else in those galaxies that's holding the stars in, keeping them from getting tossed off like ping pong balls. So they invented the idea of dark matter, right? Dark meaning we can't see it, we didn't know about it before. Matter meaning something that has gravity. This is an old physics trick, right? You say, we don't know what this is, so let's give it a fancy sounding name, right? That's really what dark matter is. Dark just means we don't know what it is, but it has gravity, okay? So this is a crazy idea, and it took people a while to understand it and to really appreciate it and to believe it. And to understand what we mean by dark and dark matter, we have to think for a moment about how things interact. So there's four ways that particles can interact with each other. First is gravity, of course. That's how we discover dark matter. Everything with mass feels gravity towards it, it, itself. Then there's electromagnetism. So things that reflect light or give off light, all these things feel electromagnetism. Then there's the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. Those are the guys that hold the nucleus together or radioactively decay it. So in the case of dark matter, what do we know? Well, we know it feels gravity. That's how we discovered it. We know it doesn't feel electromagnetism because it doesn't give off light or reflect light. We're pretty sure it doesn't feel the weak force or the strong nuclear force, which means there's no way to interact with gravity. There's no way we can probe it or measure it or study it other than, uh, other than gravity, right? Gravity is the only way we can get. It hasn't answered any of my social media requests at all, which I think is pretty rude. All right, so 5% um, of the universe is the stuff we know, stars and planets and gas and dust and all that stuff. And when you want to explain how these galaxies are rotating, you don't have to add just a little bit of matter. It's not like a 5% or a 2% effect. You have to add five times as much matter as we already knew about, right? That's a crazy idea. If you do an experiment and the answer can only make sense if you postulate the existence of a huge amount of new kind of previously unseen matter that nobody's ever discovered before that fills the universe, that's a crazy idea. And it takes scientists a while before they believe it. And dark matter wasn't really accepted until we found other ways to see it. So one of the other ways we can see dark matter is through gravitational lensing. So dark matter is dark, meaning you, uh, you can't see it directly and light can pass through it, but it's matter, so it bends space. It acts like a lens in the sky. 
So imagine a photon from a galaxy far, far away is shooting out into space. It can get bent towards you by dark matter. Now, another photon shooting out in another direction can also get bent towards you by dark matter. What that means is if you look at two places in the sky, you can see the same galaxy twice, right? So either you've been smoking too many banana peels or there's something crazy going on, something invisible that's lensing that galaxy. If you've never seen this, you could just Google image search gravitational lensing later. You see these amazing, beautiful images of gravitational lensing. But the final piece of information that, in my view, really proved that dark matter was a thing was this collision of galactic clusters. So I'm a particle physicist. I like to understand stuff. And the way I do it is I smash it together, right? Take two particles, break them together. That's how we understand it. That approach doesn't really work when it comes to galaxies, right? You can't build a galaxy collider. I mean, I'd like to, right? But it's too expensive. So the astrophysics approach, instead of building the experiment, is just look out into the universe and see if it's already happening. Because the universe is big and full of crazy stuff, and usually everything is happening somewhere. So they got lucky and they identified two galaxy clusters that had slammed into each other a long time ago so that we could see it now. Now, galaxy clusters are full of galaxies, each of which has dark matter and also normal matter. So what happens when two galaxy clusters slam into each other? Well, the dark matter passes right through to the other side. It doesn't interact with the normal matter, doesn't interact with itself as far as we know. It passes right through. Some of the normal matter, the gas and the dust mostly, makes huge collisions, boom, bam, etc. all this kind of stuff. So the cool thing here is that the dark matter got separated from some of the gas and the dust, which means we can see them separately, right? And we can tell that the dark matter has its own gravity from the gravitational lensing from the background galaxies. That means that dark matter really is its own thing. It's not a misunderstanding of the way we think about gravity. It's its own thing with its own gravity, its own new kind of matter that we don't understand. So that was pretty convincing evidence. But what is dark matter, right? We know it's there. We know there's a lot of it, right? More of it than of us. But we still don't know what it is. The scientist's leading theory is that it's all made out of one simple kind of particle, which to me sounds like maybe the dumbest idea, right? But of course, it's also the first idea, right? Let's try to explain it with one simple thing. I hope dark matter is something else. I hope dark matter is something crazy, something weird. Maybe dark matter is a lot of different kind of particles and they have dark physics and dark chemistry, right? Maybe even dark biology and who knows, maybe they're even you know, dark tourists somewhere. We have no idea what's out there in the world of dark matter and it's dangerous to extrapolate from our 5% to the rest of that 27%, okay? Remember, there's much more dark matter in the universe than there is what we call normal matter. Our matter is actually not very normal, it's, it's unusual. All right, so if we're gonna explain what the universe is made out of, we, we, we're up to 33%. We have 5%, which is the stuff we know. 27% is dark matter. We're kind of clueless about. What about the rest of that pie, right? What about the two-thirds of it? Well, this is something we call dark energy. But dark energy is science code for we have no idea what this stuff is, really. Um, and the only relationship between dark energy and dark matter is literally just the word dark, okay? Which is physics code for we're clueless. So how can we possibly know that two-thirds of the energy density in the universe is bound up in this mysterious thing? Well, to do that, you have to know something about the history of the universe. So let's have a quick recap on the history of the universe. So Big Bang, right? Then exciting stuff happened, like cats were made, right? And then people were wondering, what's going to happen next? Well, there's various scenarios. Either there's enough stuff in the universe that there's enough gravity that it's going to slow everything down, eventually stop it, turn it around, and come back to make a big crunch, right? So that's one exciting conclusion to our universe's story. Another possibility is that there isn't enough stuff in the universe, and that things will drift out gradually, slowing down, but never actually turning around, okay? This is called the heat death of the universe, right? Very cozy sort of compared to the big crunch. So people thought, well, is one of these two perhaps, so let's go out and check. Let's go see how the universe, what the universe is doing, and maybe we can figure it out. So they went out and did the experiment, and they discovered the universe didn't want option A, the big crunch, or option B, the heat death, but it went for secret option C, okay? 
I love when the universe goes for the secret option C. So secret option C was, after the Big Bang, things aren't slowing down at all. Uh-uh. Things are speeding up. Things are accelerating. Galaxies are moving apart from each other faster and faster. In fact, new space is being created between us and other galaxies. So the expansion of the universe is not slowing down at all. It's incredibly accelerating. This is what we call dark energy. We've observed this to be happening, but we don't understand it. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know what's doing it. We don't know why it's doing it. We don't know if it's going to continue to do it. We don't know anything about the mechanism for it. Theorists try to calculate, maybe it's the energy of empty space, but then they come up with a number that's off by 10 to the 100, right? Which is not a little mistake. So it's fair to say that we don't know what the future holds, right? Um, but we know that it's going to be interesting, right? We know that um, these galaxies, currently, the galaxies are moving away from us faster than the light from them can reach us, okay? It's not that they're violating relativity, but the space that's being created between us and them is being created faster than the speed of light can travel through it. It's like Usain Bolt is running towards you and somebody's laying new track between you and him fast, faster than he can get there. So what does that mean about the future? I don't know, but things are disappearing over the edge of our observable universe. Things that we can see now, we wouldn't be able to see in a billion years if dark energy continues. And it's possible that future astronomers looking up in the night sky will see it much, much darker than we see it today, right? What will future astronomers uh, do? How will they understand the universe? Assuming astronomy survives the age of Trump, right? <laughs> so, um, so we don't know, right? It's hard to predict. Um, and before you congratulate yourself and say, well, I'm glad that we're alive now when we know so much about the universe, we can see so much, remember that we're 14 billion years into the universe. What has already disappeared from our sky that we will never know about? Well, we have no idea, right? All right, so here's a brief summary of the situation in the universe. Most of the universe, most of the energy budget of the universe is something we only recently learned we don't know anything about, okay? That is humbling, but it's also inspirational. It means there are crazy things to be discovered. A huge fraction of the universe is dark matter, something we don't understand. We know it's there, we know it's matter, but we don't really know much else about it. The rest of the universe is me and you and dark chocolate, okay? And we're this little slice in the universe at the bottom, right? You can't extrapolate from what we know into what we don't know, right? That's what we try to do, it's how we try to understand the universe, but it's a dangerous game. What does the future hold? I don't know, but if you could pick up a child's, a child's book from the year 3000, it would contain truths that would blow your mind, right? Things that people will know in 3000 years or 1000 years, they will look at those books and know things about the universe and look back and wonder, what was it like to be so ignorant, right? How could people not know these basic things about the universe? What was it like to not know these things? Uh, so it's a fascinating time. Um, I hope that we figure these things out soon. I hope that these are the days when people look back and say, wow, I wish I had been a physicist in 2018 when we figured out blah, 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 solution to the universe, right? That would be really exciting. So in our book, we talk about this one question, what is the universe made out of? It's a pretty basic one. We also talk about other questions that are difficult to tackle, like what is space? What is time? Um, all sorts of questions that are so big and so deep that scientists sometimes aren't actively working on them because they're just these really deep questions. Um, so I hope that I haven't discouraged you by showing you all the things that science doesn't know. It's not that I want to criticize science, but I want to focus on the, the part of science that's about discovery. And to me, the part of science that's about discovery is asking those really big questions. So thanks very much for your attention. Clap it up. Yes. That was fun. I'm sure that somebody in here has got questions. So the way this works is I have a microphone. Katie right there will have a microphone. Wave us down. We'll try to get microphones and get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and it sounds like they're both really smart, so ask really good questions. All right, we're going to get started. Right there. Okay, uh, this is a great, great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, everybody probably knows that Albert Einstein was voted the person of the 20th century by Time Magazine with 100 experts coming to that conclusion. Uh, and even though there were, there were a lot of people in, in the running for that title, Einstein said of thermodynamics, 
that is the most fundamental of all science. And in thermodynamics, he said that the laws are least likely ever to be overthrown of any science or physics. And thermodynamics teaches us that the heat is given off by different processes that's never recovered, like the collision of stars or the twitch of a mosquito's wing or rubbing one's hand across the table, you never recover that heat. And eventually, you have a lukewarm universe where no further processes can take place. How do you feel about this? I never liked thermodynamics. Um, I think that's far, far in the future. Um, so I don't think it's anything we have to worry about, right? Uh, the future heat death of the universe. But I think it raises a lot of really interesting questions. You know, one question is, um, what's going to happen at that point, right? Does time stop? Because a lot of people think that time itself is connected to this idea of entropy. That as things get to maximal disorder, that time itself will stop. We might learn something, right? Um, another interesting question is, why did the universe start at a state that's so highly ordered, that gave us so much time to get to that position of disorder? We don't know the answer to those questions, but I think the good thing is to think about these deep questions and to wonder about them, and those generate other questions, which hopefully will lead to great insights. But I, I can't answer that one for you tonight, sorry. Uh, my question is not nearly as intelligent as that one. Um, on your slide of uh, the size of the universe versus time, where you had it from Big Bang to Cat, uh, it was portrayed the as being- Cat was not to scale, by the way. I, that was my next question, thank you. Um, it was portrayed as being more or less linear to date. Was that just a random representation, or do we have evidence that it's been somewhat linear? No, it's been enormously cataclysmically non-linear, actually. Ca cataclysmically. Cataclysmically, oh my gosh. That was an accidental kind. No, the, uh, in, the, in this very first moment, in like the first 10 to the minus 30-something seconds, the universe went an incredible moment of expansion we call inflation. And that's the biggest moment of expansion since. So it's more like it grew really quickly, rapidly, and then it cooled off for a bit, and then recently it's been taking off again. So dark energy turned on about five billion years ago and has been expanding the universe ever since. So there's the first big wave of expansion, and then this one now. And we don't know, are there more ripples? Right? What's gonna happen? We, we can't understand it, yeah. So that was just uh, some cartooning license. I got one. I uh, just had a question, I guess, from my perspective, uh, one of the things that, I guess, a uh, long time back, there was this concept of ether Thank that you. existed, right, in physics, where nothingness was ether and blah, 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 and then obviously it turned out to be wrong. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, the concept of dark energy, or maybe even for that matter, dark, dark matter, 50, 100 years from now, we look back and we're like, oh, we were so wrong, and what is it that, I guess, we could just be asking all these questions, but it actually does not exist. Would that be a possibility? Absolutely, that's a possibility. I mean, some of these things are really just placeholders. Like, ether was actually an idea, right? It was a theory. It says, we think the universe is filled with this stuff, and that explains how light moves through it and makes electromagnetism work. Dark energy isn't an idea. It's just like a, you know, here's what we saw. It doesn't make any sense. Somebody please explain this. Okay, so absolutely, we could learn that kind of stuff. But also, in the future, we could learn that dark matter isn't just a particle, or maybe it's a totally different kind of matter from the thing we imagined, right? We're starting off uh, thinking, maybe dark matter is one particle, maybe it's two particles. Maybe dark matter is something totally weird and new. Maybe it's matter that's not even made out of particles, right? We don't know. There's still a lot of room for crazy discoveries there. So what we have now are sort of placeholders. We say, here's what we understand and then we carefully build models and make them more and more elaborate, and then we check them as much as we can, and then when we figure out that they don't work, that's when we have to toss them. But we need new ideas also. So absolutely, I look forward to overthrowing some of these theories, yes. So that question about entropy, the comments on order to disorder, which I know isn't quite really what entropy is, but I've always thought that We've got it kind of wrong. To me, it seems like once everything is spread out and all even in the universe, which we seem to want to call disorder, 
to me seems like it's more ordered and the universe would actually want everything to be like like life is that how you organize your kitchen <laughs> yes that's right that's right you spread everything out on the floor yeah i yeah. mean every atom should be this Duh. far from every other atom don't you think that would be make the universe much happier but i mean gravity's kind of screwing it up i would think and organizing it <laughs> <laughs> but, but i've always wondered this so so what uh i've always wondered why you referred to it as uh you know the other way around well part of it is physicists have this tendency to use normal words in a very technical sense that means something different from what the colloquial meaning is, right? And so in this case, entropy and disorder have a very specific mathematical meaning that doesn't always align with your intuitive uh, understanding of it. But I think actually in this case it might, because I don't think that you would think something that's spread out everywhere would actually be very well ordered. Right? It's a, the, the order, ordering is compactifying and organizing. And the, think about the number of different kinds of states that something can be in is, is one way to think about it. Like a solution. When you have something in a solution and, it's, and, and it um, dissolves completely or whatever, then that's a nice, evenly spaced out solution or a gas spreading out. I'll let the universe know that you prefer that situation. I, I think we should all go to our house later, and then we can all make this up. We're going to come organize your house later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is the Higgs boson? What is, its, what, it's, what is its significance, and how does it relate to other uh, particles? Oh, great question. So what is the Higgs boson? You should watch this video. Yes. There's a great video online I've heard. Yeah, I heard yeah. about it, yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, so the Higgs boson is a particle that's responsible for giving mass to the other particles. It explains um, how the particles get mass. But the Higgs boson itself isn't the important thing. There's something else. It's called the Higgs field. So the Higgs field is something that fills the whole universe. And some particles have a hard time getting started in the Higgs field and slowing down, and other particles just flame right through it. So the Higgs field is the thing that gives these particles mass. If you interact a lot with the Higgs field, it makes it hard to get going and hard to slow down. That's what mass is, we think. So the Higgs field tells us how particles get mass. The Higgs boson is proof that the Higgs field exists. It's like when the Higgs field gets really excited, it pops out one of these particles and we can see it. Um, why is this significant? It's significant because we wonder, like, what is mass? You know, what is this thing we call mass? If you think about a particle, you think about it having mass, you probably think, oh, it's a little spinning ball of stuff, right? And the mass is the stuff that's in it, right? Because you're used to things in the world having stuff to them. But the way we think about these particles is that, that they're little points in space, zero volume points, right? There's no room for any stuff in there. And that thing, well, how can it have mass if it has no space, right? And the answer is that you can't think about mass the way you think about stuff. You should think about mass the way you think about like electric charge. If I tell you the electron has no volume, you don't worry, there's no room to put the negative charge in there, right? The negative charge is just, just like a label you put on the, on the particle. So the Higgs theory tells us that the mass is also just a label that we put on these particles. What's its significance? Well, it helps us understand mass, but it also doesn't. I mean, we don't know, for example, why does the Higgs boson give these particles a lot of mass and those particles almost no mass? There's a huge spread, like a factor of 10 to the 6 in the mass of the particles. The Higgs theory has nothing to say about that. To me, that's one of the deeper question. Why do some particles have a lot and some have none? So is the Higgs field uh, kind of like a magnetic field in that sense, or not really? Well, it's a, it's a field that permeates the whole universe. It's really different from a magnetic field. It's a scalar field. It only has one number. A magnetic field is a vector field, so it has a direction at every point in the universe. So it's, it's actually a different kind of field than anything we've ever seen before. And it's a crazy idea, right? This guy said, it's a beautiful uh, example of theoretical physics at work. Somebody was looking at the things we know and said, you know, it just doesn't quite fit together. It would be so much prettier if I added this one piece. And then everything would click together in this beautiful way. Now that one piece is a huge invisible field that fills the universe, right? So it's not a small idea, but he was right. So, you know, kudos to them. Thank you. When you showed two galaxies that were uh, interacting with each other during the collision and you showed the dark matter going through, did the dark matter, did we know if dark matter interacted with itself because it did have gravity? It's a great question. Um, so those are two galaxy clusters. 
uh, but this question still applies. As far as we know, dark matter doesn't interact with itself except through gravity, right? Now, gravity is not strong enough for that interaction to really be meaningful. If it's only gravitational interactions, it will just pass right through itself because it's fairly high velocity, the collision. However, that tells us that, gravi that dark matter doesn't have a really strong interaction with itself. It's possible that dark matter still does have some self-interactions that we haven't detected yet. Uh, so there's still a lot of room for dark matter to interact with itself. It can't interact really strongly, or there would have been collisions of dark matter. Great question. But that's actually a really popular theory right now, self-interacting dark matter. How do we know that dark energy, dark matter, are actually a thing and not just some weird property of space-time? What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I just so, see gravity as the only thing we can observe, which is, seems to be kind of related, right? So, you know, we have a, a theory of physics we're building up, and it includes these pieces. One of them is space-time. The other is stuff in space-time, right? The behavior of space-time. And so we don't know what dark matter and dark energy are. We think dark matter is a thing that lives in space because it acts the other way other things that live in space do. It bends space, right? It clumps together. Uh, the way the way um, normal matter does. So we really want to put it in that matter category because it behaves like matter in all sorts of important ways. Um, dark energy, we're really clueless about. Right? There's all sorts of crazy ideas about what dark energy could be. And it could be a property of space, like the energy of empty space. It could be something totally crazy and different. So we, we really don't know what category to put that in. But we know they're there, right? We know that they're there, yeah. Dan, here's a question for you. Do you know your UCI faculty page has not been updated since 2010? Are you volunteering? If you like. I'd have to know more about you. But uh, it, it says you're about to go to work on the uh, Large Hadron Collider. I am. I'm Pres always about to go work on the Large Hadron Collider. You are there. And they have let you play with it, right? right? Yes, I do research at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, so you're blasting particles around a 17-mile circle at a good point. 33 kilometers. It's European. At the, okay, at a good portion of the speed of light, right? How, how big a proportion is that? 0.99 something. Okay. Yeah. As a bit of matter uh, goes faster, does it not acquire mass? Well, it's, uh, there's lots of ways to look at it. One way to look at it is that things that move quickly acquire mass. Um, yeah, you can look at it that way, absolutely. So by the time it's going 99% of the speed of light, has it almost almost achieved infinite mass? I mean, well, it depends what you mean by almost, right? Okay, uh, like a bowling ball, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, a little I, can't, I can't tell you the, the, off the top of my head what the mass of a relativistic proton is, but it's true that as things go faster, you can give them a new idea of mass, a relativistic mass, and that mass goes up. And, if, and it approaches infinity as you get to the speed of light. But nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. Right. So, and if it, Turn and, it and if it did, it would have infinite mass, which is impossible. Okay, so you got a particle going around, protons, gold molecules, whatever, and we're not real sure how how much mass they actually acquire. What happens to the mass when you turn the experiment off and let them slow down? Where does it go? Well, mass and energy are really just two sides of the same coin, right? And so these protons have a lot of energy. You can call it the relativistic mass. You can call it the relativistic energy. But if you slow the protons down, that energy goes somewhere, right? You can't slow things down okay. without that energy. I know where it goes. Yeah, so we so dump the protons into a beam dump, for example, that get absorbed into a big blob of, of, um, of um, concrete, okay. for example. Does that answer your question? More or less. Yeah. yeah. The other, only other part. This is a multi-part question, isn't it? How do you get them it? started in the first place? How do we get them started? Yeah. Uh, we, use, uh, we take hydrogen atoms, which are proton and electron. We strip off the electron, so you just get the proton. And then they have an electric charge, so we can just use an electric field to kick them for in the very beginning. But don't they use gold atoms as well? They do. They do gold atoms and lead atoms sometimes. Yeah, basically. Yeah, can I borrow some? Do you have any? Yeah. We ionize the gold, and then it has a charge, and then we can accelerate it. I think they all go to your web page. That's probably where they're... <laughs> so go to danielwhiteson.com. <laughs> is that what it is? So, um, Jorge, I'm going to make you speak. You've got a really successful comic online. People love Piled Higher and Deeper, uh, especially people in academia, I've learned, because it's so relatable to their life. 
why did you want to help write a book about astrophysics in the universe? I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, no, well, um, part of it was that I was, uh, I've been doing the comics for a long time and I was looking to do other types of comics, not just kind of like characters. I, uh, I liked explaining things. Uh, and so when Daniel contacted me to create this video and this, these comics, um, yeah, I just kind of jumped at the chance and we really like working together. And so the next uh, couple of other steps in between, we got the opportunity to write this book. I've got a question, Dr. Whiteson. Hey, um, and I don't know if this is going to violate publishing etiquette or not. In the book, you address cosmic rays and the huge question mark unknown source. Um, I thought how you addressed it was really, really interesting and very compelling, very engaging. Thank you. Um, is it a breach of etiquette to talk just for a few minutes about your Cray Fizz site and utilizing? the billions of cell phones as a cosmic ray detector. Sure, yeah, so um, for those of you who haven't read the book, one question we have about the universe is why the Earth is being bombarded by really crazy high energy particles, much, much higher energy than anything we make in our accelerator, like a million times more energetic, and also a thousand times more energetic than anything we understand. Like you ask an astrophysicist, what's the highest energy particle you expect to see anywhere in the universe? They give you a number. We see particles a thousand times more energetic than that, right? Which means there's something crazy or someone crazy out there shooting particles at the Earth. We don't know what it is, which guarantees there's something new in the universe to discover, right? Problem is these particles are pretty rare, so they're hard to see. And they have a really big telescope in South America that covers a thousand, uh, 3,000 square kilometers because you, the particle hits the atmosphere and it knocks into other particles. You get this big shower of particles that hits the ground in a big flash of light. So they're really hard to see because they're really big and they're really rare. And so if you could cover the Earth with a detector, you could see a lot more of these and maybe understand where they're coming from. So me and my research group, we had the idea that maybe we could use uh, detectors which are in everybody's pocket because the camera in your smartphone is a particle detector. And your smartphone has a little computer and it knows where it is and it can upload data. So we wrote an app and the app turns your uh, smartphone into a particle detector. And then we said, well, how many of these things do we need to actually do science? So we did some calculations and we discovered if we had just a few million people running this app, we could build a telescope that spanned the Earth like, that's an awesome idea, right? A telescope the size of the Earth looking out into space. And maybe we could see a lot of these particles and understand where they're coming from. But actually, my favorite part is every time astronomers build a new device and look out into the universe in a new way, they see something crazy. They see something unexpected because the universe is filled with crazy stuff, right? Things we didn't anticipate. So I'm always excited about building a new kind of device. So I hope we can build this uh, worldwide cosmic ray telescope and it will discover something totally weird that nobody's ever expected before. So that, that's the idea. So thanks for, for plugging website, our experiment. Right? Crayfish.io? Yes, that's right. Crayfish.io. It stands for cosmic rays found in smartphones. Yeah. Oh, oh. Go ahead. So Jorge, I have a question for you also. If, despite the fact that there seems to be a phenomenally large number of really sciencey, really geeky people in this room tonight, um, more than usual. In the best way possible. In the best way possible. Yeah, be. Really, um, by and large, as we all understand these days, it's really, really important to communicate science to the rest of us. So can you, and I would imagine if you were trying to communicate things about, important things about robotics to ordinary citizens, that would be like easier to do because it's something physical that you can see and touch and you know observe and stuff. But talk a little bit about the challenges of trying to help people understand this kind of super complicated stuff that I imagine is all discovered through mathematics and through other abstract ways of thinking. So are you just trying to make it fun for people so they'll be more interested in asking questions or are you actually trying to help them understand what does your process look like? Yeah, no, I totally agree that it's super important to uh, be communicating science and the process of science and the way scientists think uh, to the general public. It's super important uh, these days, definitely. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, 
for me, the, the it was about using uh, visuals to communicate a lot of these concepts. You know, and if you pick up a physics journal paper or an article, it's mostly all text, and maybe there are some graphs. And so I was really interested in using what I've learned in comics and cartoons to really sort of represent that um, and, and help people sort of understand that. Uh, one of the things that I know, Daniel, you say a lot is that he, uh, we think that the cartoons, like in, in this book, um, one of the things that I, we think it does is that it helps people feel more relaxed about it. You know, the, these topics can be very intimidating. They can sound very intimidating, and a lot of people just have that automatic reaction, like, oh, I, I'm not, I didn't study physics in, in college or high school. Uh, I'm never going to understand these things. And so I think just having the cartoons kind of helps that a lot. Just makes people a little bit more relaxed. They see that it can be fun. They can they 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 can understand it. Yeah. I'm coming. Got one right here. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I was curious. I don't know if it's still taboo or not, but if there's any studies that are emerging, any spiritual aspects of it, like higher forms of consciousness, like sacred geometry. I don't know if it's even in your art, but I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I see that is very repetitive on a small scale that's also seen on a very large scale. And if there's any studies that are like kind of, I don't, I don't know, like involving the dark matter unknown universe in, into this scientific, I, I like seeing a spiritual scientific merge. So I don't know if there's anything, any studies I'm kind of rambling now. But, yeah. <laughs> well, in, uh, in this area, we're uh, often confronted with really deep questions. And those questions sometimes have a scientific side and sometimes have a philosophical side, right? Because the answer to these questions could change the way you live your life, right? Imagine, for example, you knew how the universe was created, right? That is a scientific question we can answer. We can do an experiment. We haven't done it yet. We haven't figured it out. But one day we might know the factual answer for the creation of the universe, right? And that could change the way you live your life. Um, but so there's the scientific side where we try to learn these answers, these objective truths, and then there's the philosophical or spiritual side, which is what do you do with that, right? Yeah. And there's always that side of it, because science can't answer every question. It can't an tell you, should you get out of bed this morning? You know, Should you have that second plate of french fries, right? Um, some of these questions are not scientific questions. So in the book, we actually talk about this, the balance between science and philosophy. Ooh. Science can address things that are testable, that are concrete, but philosophy fills in the rest for us, and it's just as important. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. That, and that boundary is changing, right? right? We mentioned that in the book. As we develop new techniques, things move from philosophy into science, right? Things that one day that people only used to be able to speculate about, like what's beyond the sky, right? That used to be philosophy. Now that's science. So I look forward to the days when, you know, the, the universe of science is expanded even further. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi. I have a question about, uh, we say the universe is expanding. How do we observe it? Like, is it uniform? Is, are, are we expanding as such? Or is, is dark matter found in certain locations? It's, it's not everywhere? Or how, how do you identify that? Great. So that was two questions. One is, is the universe expanding uniformly? Uh, as far as we can measure, it is, and it's expanding in every direction simultaneously. Okay, it's sort of like a loaf of bread with raisins in it, right? Everything is moving further apart, right? That's the classic example. But your other question was about dark matter, and dark matter is not uniform. It's not everywhere. In fact, dark matter clumps together with normal matter. So there's dark matter here with us right now, like in this room. It's in my hand. I can't hold it because it passes right through me, right? Oh. But it's here with us. And there's an important reason why dark matter is together with normal matter. It's because of gravity. It all clumps together. And if we didn't have dark matter together with normal matter, we wouldn't have galaxies, for example. Dark matter is the thing that's responsible for pulling together the normal matter to the density you need to make stars and galaxies and life and you know, uh, amazing evening events that you can go to. So thanks to dark matter for our existence. Uh, and thanks, Sergey, for your comments get, got me through. That's good, basically. And I apologize. I have not seen your comics, but I assure you I will. <laughs> Is um, your website up to date, Jorge? Yeah. <laughs> uh, last week I updated it, yes. <laughs> good. I'll be checking. It, in a world full of what we call fake news these days, so without getting political, but just getting on a more philosophical bent, uh, in your book or during your talks, are you often um, do you impress upon people the need for a critical thinking uh, to try to help explain, especially to lay people, 
make sure you're understanding your information. We know science, but it's a sphere, and it's based on some a priori assumptions. You know, outside of that sphere of knowledge, we don't know squat, and that's what your book's all about, I think. Um, can you impress upon people the need to make sure that the information they're looking at is as accurate as it can be or as factual as it can be, and can you also Im inform people that what we know, these facts, are just the tip of an infinite iceberg of information. I mean, information's infinite, so we can't know it all. So everything we peel back on this onion is just another layer of a story of discovery. I think we so should write a book about that. It's kind of a question, but it's kind of a statement, too. You might want to write a book about that. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree, and I think it's important that people think for themselves and ask questions and make their own understanding of the universe. And uh, you know, science isn't something that has to happen in front of a computer or wearing a lab coat. You can do it in your everyday life when you just understand the world around you and what people are saying. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, I have a question for Jorge here. Uh, I've been following, you know, as you know, your comic for a long time, but I haven't seen anything biology related. So <laughs> do you plan to do in future? <laughs> That's our next book. Next, next book. <laughs> we have no idea. Biology edition. <laughs> because we really don't know anything about biology, so <laughs> it's be pretty short. At least we don't. <laughs> well, do one? given how very recently both dark matter and dark energy were discovered, um, don't you think those percentages could dwindle down to all that we know, including dark energy and dark matter, becomes 1% when just 20 or 1,000 years from now we make a discovery of the other layers? Is that your personal fantasy for the future? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want us to be even less uh, consequential, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way we phrase that, it's not supposed to describe all of human knowledge. It's very specifically the fractions of the energy density of the universe that we can understand. And that's something we've really probed with quite some precision. We've measured it lots of different ways. We always get the same answer with several different measurements. So we're pretty confident about the fractions of the energy density of the universe. But you're absolutely right. There could be something else totally different that we haven't even touched on. And, you know, I became a particle physicist because my personal scientific fantasy is to discover something that just blows up everything we think we know. You know, I have this fantasy where I find something and I bring it to the physicist and they're like, what? You must be crazy, right? And that's happened in reality. You know, the Michelson-Morley experiment, all this kind of stuff really blew up people's minds. It took 20 years for people to accept it. So I look forward to more of those events. Yeah, absolutely. Let's give these two one more round of applause. Fantastic stuff. I don't know how we got you to come to Raleigh, but I'm so glad that we did. Thank you all for inviting us. And thanks to all of you as well for coming out to the Science Cafe. Just so you know, we're here every Thursday night bringing scientists onto the stage to share their work, give you the chance to ask questions. So check out naturalsciences.org for more information. I want to see you all out here every Thursday night getting involved in the world of science and the museum right here in Raleigh. Keep in mind all the cool events that are going on tomorrow night, finally Friday, Star Trek II. Get your tickets online. Come join us for that. We have science stations before so we can do activities. And then the movie starts at 7. We have food and beverages for purchase. And then don't forget about the Thrillers event on the 23rd with John Grisham and John Hart. Y'all have a great night. Thanks so much for coming out. And if you have more questions, we'll be here answering them. And if you'd like to buy a book, we have them here. So come on down. Y'all come buy this book.